Amen. If everybody wants to make their way in this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> Feels so good to be in the house of the Lord on another Sunday. It's good to have Sister Jean back with us. It's her first service back since her injury, so it's great to see her. Um, it's great to see Stephen in the house this morning. This is Seth's dad in the in the red shirt back here. He's uh, he's joining us for service today. So let's give them a, a life point welcome today. I'm so excited. We just got back from youth convention. It was a powerful time. We're really tired, but God did some incredible things. We had some great reports. Um, a lady messaged Andrew this morning. He's the youth president, and she said that um, they just started a church in West Kelowna, and she said that um, three people are being baptized today at their church. And she said that all the youth, they have 11 youth that came wow. to youth convention, and they all were touched by God, and it, God just moved in a powerful way. The, the sermons were super encouraging. It was just an amazing time. So I'm really excited about that. But we're all tired, but we're here by the grace of God, and it feels good to be home back at LifePoint. So we're just going to run through a couple quick announcements this morning. This week on Monday night, there is Igniting the Flame Ladies Bible Study. And this is going to be happening at 6.30 p.m. in the church foyer. And all the ladies are welcome to attend. So please see Sister Jennifer Cole for more information about that. Wave your hand, Sister Cole. Amen. So this is tomorrow. This is tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. in the church foyer. Tuesday night. Everyone say Tuesday night. Tuesday night prayer, we have prayer, uh, we have a prayer service here at the church every single Tuesday um, at 7 o'clock p.m. We pray for each other, we pray for our city, we pray for needs. It's a powerful time. If you've never been here in the sanctuary on a Tuesday night, I encourage you to come out. God's always moving and God's always up to something and it's just so powerful, so I invite you to join us. Everyone say, Wednesday. Wednesday there is Bible study at 7 o'clock p.m. downstairs in the fellowship center if you want to come early we usually have some some coffee sometimes we have some goodies it's a great time of fellowship and going deeper in the word of God and this happens every Wednesday night here at 7 o'clock p.m. it's our midweek discipleship service it's a, it's a great time I encourage you to come out um, this Thursday everyone say Thursday. Thursday I'm really just getting you to repeat after me so it wakes me up a little bit <laughs> this Thursday there is no lifeline um, Pastor Brent and Melissa, they're going to be traveling back um, this week, so there will be no lifeline, and uh, so it'll be postponed until next week. I believe they have it at 6 o'clock p.m. every single Thursday downstairs. It's for Hertz Habits and Hangups, and it's our, our Celebrate Recovery program here at, at LifePoint. It's our 12-step our Christ-centered um, recovery group, and it's phenomenal. It's a great time, and uh, if you have any Hertz healings, if you need any healing, if you have any hangups, it's a great place to come, and I'm sure that that we all have something that we're dealing with. So come check it out on Thursdays at 6 o'clock p.m. Man, we got, we got something going on every day of the week. <laughs> I'm almost out of breath. I'm almost out of breath. Friday night, um, there is a rally in Prince George at Acts 29 Church at 7 o'clock p.m. If you want to know more information, you can come see me. There's also a billboard if you exit the back of the church here on the right-hand side, and it has all the details and information on that. It's going to begin at 7 o'clock p.m., so we're gonna, there's going to be different churches coming together in Prince George for a, a time of worship and fellowship, and I encourage you, if you can come, to, to come on out to that. If you need a ride, just just let us know. Reach out to me, and we'll, we'll find out uh, who's going, and we can get you some more details on that. So with that being said, let's all stand this morning. How many people are, are ready to worship the Lord this morning in spirit and in truth? We're excited that you're here today. If the usher can join us at the front, we're going to take up our Sunday morning tithes and offerings. And we're going to pray for those first, Lord. We just pray right now that you would bless everyone that's able to give this morning, God. We pray that you would use this for the furtherance of your kingdom. Lord, your, your word says that you love a cheerful giver, God. And in your word, it says to try you and, and to see if you will not open up the floodgates of heaven. And we just pray, God, that you would touch the people that can give, touch the people that can't give. And I just pray that you would bless them, Lord God, for being faithful and supporting the church. And everyone said in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm excited for what God's going to do. Why don't you join us in a time of worship as we lift up the name of Jesus Christ this morning.
Lord Jesus Christ today. Hallelujah, we worship you, Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the ending, the first and the last, God. We just lift up the name of Jesus Christ this morning. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I want that to be my prayer this morning. Jesus, less about me and more about you. I must decrease and you must increase. That's what John the Baptist said. He said, I must, I must decrease and he must increase. Because he says there's one coming whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. And he said that he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Hallelujah. Come on, church. There's... There's one who's coming, and he's coming back very soon for his church. Hallelujah. How many people are thankful for what they feel in this place today? I feel God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm excited to get into the word of the Lord this morning. If you want to turn to your neighbor or greet somebody in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't you just do that for a moment? Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to trans We're going to transition this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, would you turn with me to the the book of Psalms chapter 23? Most of you already you, you know what this psalm is. It's a very familiar portion of scripture to the church and the unchurched alike. Amen. I give honor to my wife and this worship team. Didn't they do a tremendous job this morning leading us into the presence of the Lord? Amen. Psalm chapter 23. I'm going to be reading this in the King James Version. We're just going to be going through the whole thing today. And I've kind of, as I was going through this, I'm like, this is like a, a six-week uh, sermon series that I'm going to break down into a message. So I'm not, I'm not going to try and keep you too long today, but I might go a little bit over 25, 30 minutes if that's all right with you. We're just going to let God do what he wants to do, amen? Sometimes you just got to throw the schedule out the window and let God do what he wants to do. And I feel, I feel that God's going to do something very special in this place and significant in this place today. Amen. Why don't you read it with me? Verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It goes on to say, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How many people are thankful for the word of God this morning? With the help of the Lord, I want to preach to you a message this morning titled The Shepherd. 
the shepherd. Let's pray this morning. In the name of Jesus, God, I just pray this morning that our hearts would be prepared to receive the word of God, that our minds would be opened, God, that you would speak to us directly, God, individually and corporately as the body of Christ. I pray that, that you would just minister to us, God, that there would be healing, that there would be miracles, signs, and wonders, God, in this church today, God, that you would transform us from the inside out, God, and I just pray that you would have your liberty, that, you, that we would just give you permission right now to do what only you can do, God, we just give you the praise and the honor and the glory. And everyone said, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Psalm 23, it's one of the, the best known and the most popular psalms. I got a shepherd's staff with me this morning. It's going to be my, my prop. Don't worry, I'm not going to hook you with it. It's one of the most popular and it's one of the most widely used psalms. Ministers worldwide, they have used this psalm to comfort people through trials, through, through illness, and even death. And it, it has become a, 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 a favorite biblical passage for, for many people. Psalms 23 not only gives us powerful insight into God's protection his guidance, and his blessings, but it also, it, it, it almost paints a poetic image of a powerless sheep being tended by an unfailing, careful shepherd. And we're going we're gonna to just dissect this a little bit, so um, we're going to be beginning in verse 1. The Bible says that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The, uh, the, the title of this psalm, if you look in your Bible, I know in my Bible it says it's a psalm of David. David is the author of this psalm. And David once was a, a humble shepherd boy who ultimately became Israel's king. And, and he was the writer of, of this psalm. And, and as I said, most Bibles do say that this portion of Scripture is ascribed to David with that title, a psalm. Of David. There are no doubts that David's life was full of ups and downs. He was criticized by his brothers when his father sent him with, with sustenance to the battlefield. If you recall the story, David showed up at the battlefield when Goliath was taunting the armies of Israel. And he, he showed up and he, he, he slayed the giants, but his, or the giant, but his brothers criticized him. They, they said, what are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be at home tending the sheep? He ultimately became Israel's king. And before that, he was a vagabond. He served in the house of, of King Saul. And he, he ministered to Saul with music, the Bible says. And the evil spirits would depart from, from King Saul when, when David would begin to play his harp before the king, but the king would throw javelins at David, and he would get jealous at David because David was a, a, a man of war from, from his youth. He, he said that he killed the bear, and he, he killed the lion, and he, he defended the sheep, but he ultimately had to flee from his life from King Saul, who got jealous of David because the people begin to, sit, to sing this song that, 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 that Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And Saul, with jealousy, drew or uh, uh, made David flee for his life. He was a vagabond, and he, he ran for his life. He was also a fornicator. David, he, he seen Bathsheba on the, mount, on the rooftop, and she was bathing, and it was, it was Uriah's wife, and he said, go and fetch me that, women, that woman, and he, he, he committed adultery with, with, with Uriah's wife, and he called Uriah home from the heat of the battlefield because she got pregnant, and he, he wanted him to go home and to lie with his wife and to cover up his mistakes. But ultimately, Uriah was such a faithful man to David. He said, how could I go home when, when the other men are fighting in the fierce battle? And ultimately, David sent a letter 
to the hand of Joab, and he said, put Uriah in the heat of the battle. Put him at the forefront so that he is sure to die. So he was an adulterer, and he was a fornicator, and he was a murderer. The Bible says that he couldn't even build the temple of God because his hands had, had shed so much blood and that his son Solomon was going to have to, to build the temple in his place. He was a, a man of war. He had good and bad experiences in his life. Am I talking to somebody today? He made good and bad decisions, haven't we all? He suffered from the same sinful condition that both you and I, we suffer from. But throughout David's life, he established something truly powerful, and that was that the Lord was his shepherd. Everyone say, the Lord is my shepherd. When David thought about God and his relationship with God, he made the analogy of a shepherd and his sheep. God was like a shepherd to David, and David was like a sheep to God. The idea of God being a shepherd to his people throughout the Bible, it's, it's very familiar, and there's there's, there's, a, there's a ton of portions of scripture that, that ascribe the title shepherd to the God of Israel or to Jehovah. In Genesis chapter 49, verse 24, Jacob called the Lord his shepherd and his stone. Isaiah 40, verse 11 tells us that the Lord will feed his flock like a shepherd and will gather his sheep into his arms. And Zechariah 13, verse 7, it speaks of the Messiah. It speaks of, of Jesus Christ who was to come, who would be struck down. And the, the Bible says that the sheep would be scattered. And this was fulfilled in, in, in Matthew when Jesus was being arrested by the religious leaders and rulers of the day. When Judas Iscariot came by night with an armed band of soldiers and they came to arrest Jesus, he told his disciples, he says, tonight I'm going to be smitten and you guys are all going to be scattered. And that's when Peter piped up and said, Lord, I'm not going to leave no matter what happens. It was Peter who drew his sword and cut off the servant of the high priest ear. But it was also that same Peter that Jesus said before the cock crows three times, you're going to betray me. So in, in John chapter 10, if we, if we jump into the New Testament, we have Jesus making this statement. In John chapter 10, verses 11, he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I find it remarkable that God himself would, would call himself a, a shepherd, and not just a shepherd, but our shepherd our good shepherd. In Israel and other um, ancient societies, a shepherd's work was considered the lowest of all works. It was a lowly job, and it was generally given to the youngest, youngest man of the family, hence the reason why David was the youngest of his brothers, and he was in the field tending the sheep. It was always given to the youngest son, and, 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 and it was an unpleasant assignment. It wasn't that fun being a tender of the sheep. And it was, it was challenging because not only would you have to guide the sheep, you would have to protect the sheep as well. And David had those experiences and those times where he had to fend his sheep off from, from, from wild animals. And the Bible even goes as far to say that there's going to be ravenous wolves that enter into church in the end time. And they're going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. So this was an unpleasant assignment, but this is so powerful. God himself, he chose to become our shepherd. And the Bible says that that, that great God of the universe, he stooped down and he humbled himself in the form of a servant and he became like one of us so that we could become like him. And he stooped down and he, he takes great care of his sheep and he laid his life down for his sheep. Aren't you thankful for a shepherd this morning who protects you, who, who loves you, who gave himself for you, who 
died on the cross so that you and I could be saved. I'm thankful for a shepherd this morning. Everyone turn to your neighbor and say, the shepherd. Turn to your other neighbor and say, the shepherd. Amen. I'm so thankful the Bible says that he will never leave us and he'll never forsake us. I'm so thankful today that the Bible says that my God shall provide all of your needs according to his riches in glory. I'm so thankful today that, that God is our protector, that he's the ultimate shepherd, and that he laid down his life for you and me. And it's powerful because when you have this understanding of God being your personal shepherd, he's not just our shepherd. But he's my shepherd. He's my, my, personal, my personal shepherd. It's, a, it's an intimate, close relationship between you and God. It's so, it's so powerful when you have this understanding uh, because you are content when you have this understanding. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. When you have Jesus, you have everything. When you have God, you have absolutely everything that you need. He said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because if you have God, you have everything. You can have the best career and be empty. You can have the most money in the world in your bank account and still be unsatisfied. You could have the best career imaginable, amen, and still have a void in your life. Because God, when he created you, and when God created me, he created you with a, a, a God-sized hole that only he can fill. And what do we do as sheep? We go astray. And we try and fill our lives with things that, that are going to make us happy. Whether it's popularity, whether you're, you're chasing that, that dream job, whether you're moving to that dream city, whether you're, you're trying to become somebody famous, whatever it is, we try to, we try to fill our lives with things that we think are going to fill us. But only God, say only God, only God can fill that God-sized gap in your life. When you have Jesus, your soul is satisfied. When you have Jesus, the voids in your life are filled and every need that you have is met. Because if you have Jesus, you have everything you need. Amen. Verse 2 goes on to say, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, and he leadeth me beside still waters. Amen. The Lord, as a shepherd, he, he knew how to make David rest when he needed it. He knew how to make David rest when he needed it, just as a, a literal shepherd would care for, for his sheep. And this holds the implication that a sheep doesn't always know what it needs. A sheep doesn't always know what is best for itself, and so it needs help from a shepherd. Aren't you thankful this morning for a pastor, for a man of God who will stand in the gap for your soul, who will give an account for you, who will protect you and for, provide for you? I'm thankful that I have a pastor in my life who cares about me and who wants the best for me. Amen. I want to remind you this morning that even when you don't know what you, uh, even, know, even though you don't know what you need, that you serve a God who is aware of every situation in your life. God knows every hurt. God knows every habit. God knows every trial. God knows every up and God knows every down in your life. The Bible says that he knows the amount of hairs that are on your head. You are special in the eyes of God. And God as our shepherd, as the shepherd, he wants the best for your life. Amen. In his book, I read um, last night in his book, it's titled, In a Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23. Uh, the writer, his, the author of the book, his name is Philip Keller. And he writes that, he wrote something that just, just grabbed my attention. It just arrested my attention. He wrote this. He said, he said that sheep do not lie down easily, and they will not unless there are four conditions met. Everyone say four conditions. 
He says, because they are timid animals, they will not lay down if they are afraid. Because they're timid animals, they will not lay down if they are afraid. Because they are social animals, they will not lie down if there is friction among the other sheep. It goes on to say, if flies or parasites trouble them, they will not lie down. And that was the whole point when, when, when David said that he anointeth my head with oil. The, 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 the shepherd would anoint the head of the lamb with oil to, to keep parasites and bugs and other things away from his eyes so that it can see clearly because a sheep's wool is so thick that it would make it a bit more pliable so that he could work around the eyes so that the sheep could see more clearly. So if there were flies or if they were parasites troubling them, the sheep would not be able to, to lie down. And finally, if, if sheep are anxious about food or hungry, hallelujah, if they're hungry or they're anxious about food, it says that they will not lie down. So rest ultimately comes because the shepherd has dealt with fear, with friction, with flies, and with famine. So if you struggle with fear today, there is a shepherd in the room. If you struggle with friction in your relationships, there is a shepherd in the room. If you struggle with annoyances and troubles in your life, there is a shepherd in the room. If you are tired and if you are weary and if you are hungry, there is a shepherd that is in the room. Praise God. God knows where those green pastures and still waters are, and he wants to lead us. He wants to lead us to a place where we can have peace in our lives. He wants to lead us to a peace where we can have a place where we can have solitude in our lives. He wants to lead us to a place where we can have joy in our lives. He wants, us, he wants to lead us to a place where we can have freedom in our lives, and he wants, us, he wants to lead us there today. How many... How many people want to be led to those green pastures and those still waters today? Would you give your, your, the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning? Verse 3, it goes on to say, we're almost halfway there, folks. Are you still hanging on? Verse 3, it says, he restoreth my soul. Hallelujah. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Amen. The tender love and care of the shepherd that was provided in the previous verses, it, it had its intended effect on David. David's soul was restored through his interaction with the shepherd who led him to those still waters and who led him to those, those green pastures. And this whole idea behind the word restore, it, it conveys the idea of rescuing a lost one, of, of, of restoration. It can also mean to turn away. And it can also mean, mean to, to bring to repentance. And it reminded me of a story when I read that this morning. It reminded me of a story that, that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verses 12 to 14, he said to his disciples, he said, how think ye? He said, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? And he said, and if so be that he find it, he said, verily I say unto you that he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. He said, even so it is not the will of your father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Some of you may have gone astray. I'm speaking to someone this morning here in this room who, who isn't where they're supposed to be or they might not be where they are supposed to be. Someone who might have wandered off the path and somebody who might have veered off the path that God had originally intended for your life and somebody who is lost in the wilderness right now. I'm here this morning to tell you that you can never exhaust the love of God or his efforts of searching for you. 
The Bible says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And the Bible says that, that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is never going to give up on you. God is never going to grow weary or tired. God is never going to leave you, and he's never going to forsake you. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God wants to restore you today, and he wants to lead you in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Come on, you can have an, you can have an encounter with God that can change the trajectory of your life today. You could have an encounter with God that, that gets you back onto that straight and narrow because the Bible says that, that broad and wide is the way to destruction, but there's a, a straight and narrow path that leads to life. And he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. You don't have to leave the same way that you came this morning. You might have came in on that wide path this morning, but you can leave on that narrow path that leads to life with the help of God, and not just you, but me as well. Hallelujah. Verse 4 goes on to say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Everyone say, comfort me. David spoke of a valley. He said, the valley of the shadow of death. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a mountaintop, and it, 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 it wasn't a broad meadow, and it, and it wasn't an, an open field that David said, but he said it, it, it's a valley. And this suggests to me being hedged in and surrounded. Has anyone ever been in a valley before? There was this valley that I had to go to school through every day, and we called it the gully. So we would come to this end of this dead road, this dead end road, and there would be this gully, and it would be a steep walk down and a steep hike up. And in the wintertime, people would bring bags, and they'd put them over their shoes, and they'd create an, like, a, a sheet of ice. And they would just slide down the gully going like 100 miles an hour. If my mom seen me doing it, she probably would have had a heart attack. But it was a valley, and when you were in the bottom, it, 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 it felt like you were at such a low point because everything else, when you look, Everything else seemed to be higher and, 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 and bigger than you. And, and it felt like I was hedged in and I was, I was surrounded. It almost felt like a hopeless place. And sometimes it did because it was really hard to climb in the wintertime. But David, he, he uses this phrase to describe some sort of dark, some sort of fearful, some sort of dreadful experience. And I don't know what kind of pain you have gone through. And I don't know what kind of, of trauma you have experienced. And I don't know how much darkness you have faced. But the Lord sent me here with a sure word this morning to tell you that you're not going through this alone. That God is with you. And that together you're going to begin to walk out of this valley. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you believe that, would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? The valley is not your destination. The valley is not your destination. The valley is not your dwelling place. And the valley is not permanent. The valley is not permanent. The shepherd is here to walk with you. The shepherd is here to comfort you this morning. The shepherd is here to bring you out of that valley. Despite everything associated with and everything that makes up the valley of the shadow of death, David said in an unwavering manner, he said, I will fear no evil. And the reason why David could make such a, a, a bold statement was because he was under the care of his shepherd. For he said, thou art with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just because you're a Christian does not mean that your life's going to be automatically void of evil. Can I get an amen this morning? Just like Pastor preached a couple weeks ago about Job. He was a just man. He was a, 
a man who eschewed evil. He was a worshiper. He was a, a man who loved God, but there was still some evil things that, that came uh, uh, by Job's way. But it does not mean uh, just because you're a Christian that, 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 that regardless of your, your present circumstances or environment, you can, uh, oh, sorry, guys, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Just because you are a Christian does not mean that your life will, not, will, will be void of evil. But it, does, but it does mean that regardless of your present circumstances or environment, you can look to God as your shepherd and know you are with me. And because you are with me, I will fear no evil. David concludes, he, he concludes verse 4, with thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. This is a big study on its own, but I'm just going to break it down really narrow to you and uh, just give you a little bit of revelation, something that God, God showed me this morning. The rod and the staff, it, it, it appears to be two names for one instrument used by a shepherd. So it had a, a twofold purpose, this stick right here. It was used as a walking stick for the shepherd. They would go into crevices on rocks and they would climb and it would, it would help to have that, that extra bit of, of stability when they, were, when they were traversing difficult terrain. So it had a twofold purpose. It, it would be used as a, a walking stick and, the, and, and it also is used gently. It was used gently. Sometimes maybe it was used as, it was used roughly to guide and to direct the sheep. So the shepherd would use this staff to, to bring the sheep in and to, and to direct them and to, to get them in the right direction. And he would use it to, to direct the sheep, and he would also use it. It's a threefold purpose. <laughs> he would use it to protect the animals as well. I don't know about you, but when, when David went to fight Goliath, he had a shield, a sword, and a spear. And these were close, close hand weapons. But David, he had that, that slingshot. Amen. And it was a far distance weapon. And, you know, Goliath called for David and he said, send me a man. But God sent him a boy. And God directed that stone. Come on. That's just like, a, that's just like praying in the spirit. It's so accurate when you begin to pray in the spirit that God's going to direct that prayer and it's going to go exactly where it needs to go because the Bible says that the spirit of God maketh intercession through the saints of God. So God is, is literally praying through you the perfect will of God. But the staff was used to guide and it was used to protect and it was used for the shepherd to, to, to walk. To know that God had, had guided David, that God had, had corrected him, and that God had protected him through the valley, it, it brought great comfort to David. When David seen Bathsheba and he, he sinned and they, he committed adultery with her, God sent a man, Samuel. And he talked to him about the story of the sheep. And he said a man had a, a, a pet sheep and his family loved it and they raised it and they fed it. And it was just like a, it was just like a family member to them. And the Bible says that, that his neighbor, I'm just paraphrasing, but another man close to him, he, he had company coming in through, through town. And he didn't want to kill one of his own sheep. So he took the neighbor's sheep and he killed, he killed that innocent lamb and destroyed the, the feelings of that family. And David said that man should die for what he did. And Samuel said, that man is you. That man is you. And he, he smote David. But that, when, when God sent David a man, it wasn't to hurt his feelings. It was to correct him. It was to help him and it was to guide him. And I don't know about you, but I need a man of God in my life who can speak into my life, who can correct me, who can show me, who can guide me, and who can tell me that the path I'm on is not right. But this is so powerful. God showed me this this morning. This was a, a type and a foreshadow of what was to come in the New Testament. This is awesome. John chapter 14, verse 16 to 18. Jesus said, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. 
Remember thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I will give you another comforter that he, am, he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. He says, but you know him. You know the spirit of truth. He says, for he dwelleth with you. That's Jesus. And he said, and shall be in you. And he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So when you receive the Holy Ghost, this is powerful. When Jesus was born in Jerusalem or Bethlehem, he was God with us. He was Emmanuel, the Bible says, which is being interpreted as God in us. And the Bible says in the book of Joel, in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And when Peter got up and he preached the message on the first day of the church, God poured out his spirit upon all flesh. And it wasn't just God with them, but it was God in them. So when you have the Spirit of God living in you, that same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead resides in you. So when you fail and when you stumble through life and you fail God and you sin, you have that resurrection power living on the inside of you so you can raise back up so that you can continue to fight the good fight of faith. Am I speaking to someone this morning? Hallelujah. But just as David was comforted, Jesus said, I will be your comforter. I will be the staff that you can lead on. I can be the staff that's going to guide you and correct you and, 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 and lead you into all truth. I will guide you. I will protect you. I will, I will correct you. And that's a great comfort to know that God's not just with you, but that he is in you, working all things together for the good. Can I have five more minutes? Is five more minutes okay? Amen. Verse 5, this one's awesome. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. This is a surprising phrase. But David, being a man of war, he, he must have experienced this before. When, when you're in the heat of battle and you're hungry, you're, just, you're eating stuff as quickly as you can and you're getting back into the heat of the battle to fight. You don't have time for a fine dining banquet to sit down in front of everybody with a table that's prepared for you in the presence of your enemies and just sit in the middle of the battle and eat a beautiful meal. But he set the table up right in the presence, right in the midst of his enemies. And this is so surprising for me, but, but what I came to the conclusion of is the goodness and care suggested by the prepared table is set right in the midst of the presence of my enemies, David said. The shepherd's care his concern, and his love. Listen to this. It did not eliminate the presence of enemies, but it enables the experience of God's goodness and favor even in their midst. So there's no promise that you're not going to have any enemies. We have an enemy of our soul. The Bible says Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But we can experience God's goodness. We can experience God's favor. We can experience God's blessing even in the middle of a battle, even in the middle of a trial. You have the God of the universe that is on your side, and he's fighting battles right now that you're not even aware of. Don't allow conflict to consume the goodness of God in your life. The last time I checked, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says every good and perfect gift that cometh down from the Father of lights, it says that in whom there is no variableness. God does not change. If God was good yesterday, he's good today. If God's good today, he's going to be good tomorrow. If God's good tomorrow, he's going to be good next week. We serve a God who is good all the time, regardless of how we, we feel, regardless of what we go through. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love it. God's favor and goodness are going to turn your trials into triumphs. He's going to turn your test into a testimony. He's going to turn your mess into a message. Hallelujah. You're going to come out of this on the other side. You will come out of this anointed. Your head is going to be anointed. You're going to be anointed with the power of the Spirit. That's what trials produce. Did you know that? Did you know that the, the Garden of Gethsemane was a, a, a place of crushing? That's literally what it means. Jesus had to go there to be crushed 
That's why he said, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And do you know that oil only comes from crushing all of olive seeds? They have to go through a process of, of, of crushing and squeezing and pressure so that that crushing that you're feeling right now, that pressure that you're feeling right now, that stress that you're feeling right now is producing an anointing in you that's going to break every single yoke. Hallelujah. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? You're going to come out of this with your cup running over. It might be half full right now, but it's going to be, come on, it's going to be a party time. It's going to be splashing all over the place. It's going to be a time of rejoicing. Amen. And as I wrap this up, if we can get a musician to come, a keyboard player, that would be tremendous. Verse 6, I love this. It says, surely, everyone say, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. All, everyone say all, all the days of my life. And it says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. I read in a commentary this morning, you can come up, Sister, Sister Mary, I'll give this to you in just two moments. I, I read in a commentary this morning that mercy is the covenant word which is rendered steadfast love. steadfast love and and coupled together with 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 goodness it suggests the steady kindness and the support that one can count on in the family or between firm friends so that goodness of god and that mercy of god that's going to follow you all of the days of your life, the Bible suggests that, that that's a steady type of kindness. That it's a sure thing. So not only, this is awesome, not only are you being escorted by the shepherd, but what do you have walking behind you? You have the, the goodness, and you have the mercy. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So as, as God's leading you, the love of God and the goodness of God are going to follow you. So wherever you find yourself in life and whatever stage you might be at, you can know without a, a shadow of a doubt that God is with you. And that he is within you. And that that love of God and that goodness of God is going to follow you all the days of your life. The psalm ends, this is so powerful, the psalm ends with the calmest assurance that David, he would enjoy the presence of the Lord forever. Both in his days on, on this earth and beyond. And I don't know if, if, if many of you know who Charles Spurgeon is. There's millions of his quotes on, on the internet. I don't know when he died. I don't know um, at what point in time in history he was alive, but he was a very intelligent person. He was a Christian man. And this is, he, this is what he said. He said, while I am here, while I'm here on earth, he said, I will be a child at home with my God. And he said, the whole world shall be his house to me. He says, and when I ascend into the upper cha chamber, I shall not change my company. The people that he said he wanted to change with. He said, you're not going to change company. Nor even change the house. He said, I shall only go to dwell in the upper story of the house with the Lord forever. So when David says that phrase, when he said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're not physical beings having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a physical experience. Because the Bible says you're in the world, but you're not 
of the world. So when we come to church and we praise and we sing hymns unto God and when we're with one another, it's, it's, a powerful, it's a powerful thing. It's, a, it's almost like a mirror of, of what's to come. It's a taste of what's, of what's to come. But I don't know about you. But I do want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I do want to make heaven my home. I do want to get to the place where the shepherd can lead me and where the shepherd could guide me and where, where I can hear his voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. There's a following that has to take place. We're not going to get to heaven by ourselves. I don't know about you, but I'm a sheep. <laughs> Sometimes I do dumb things. Sometimes I say stupid things. Sometimes I veer off the path. Come on, but there's a shepherd today. Thank God for a shepherd. The shepherd. The shepherd is here this morning. Let's all stand. The shepherd is here this morning, and he's not just my shepherd, but he's your shepherd as well. The shepherd is here to walk with you. Come on, the shepherd is here to, to talk with you. The shepherd is here to guide you. The shepherd's here to pull you in if you've, if you've gone astray. The shepherd's here to, to comfort you. The shepherd's here to love you. The shepherd's here because he wants the best for your life. Come on, how, how many people want to follow the shepherd today? Come on, the, the shepherd's in the house, Jamie. The shepherd's in the house this morning, Brother Dustin. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful. I'm thankful for a man of God. I'm thankful for a shepherd. We're going to open these altars. You're free to join us up here today. But I want to remind somebody that you're not... You're not fighting this battle alone. That God still loves you. That God still cares about you. God still wants the best for your life. God still wants to shepherd you. God still wants to bring you back to that place of green pastures and, and still waters. God wants to lead you. God wants to guide you. God wants to help you become everything you